Welcome to the course, Culturally Responsive Built Environments. And today we are going to talk about culture and disasters towards method and framework. In fact, uh, here we are looking at what is the role of culture in the disaster context, you know. So what I, what I did is I divided this uh, whole study into two lectures and this is the first part of the lecture and it is actually my own work, my own doctoral research, masters, so it's almost a decade journey of uh, working in the culturally responsible built environments in disaster context. So this is the first part of the lecture which talks about how actually I have developed a method and a framework accordingly to understand the role of culture and its relation to the vulnerability. So, in fact, uh, I did uh, show this particular photograph earlier in some time back in one of the lecture and how I think it was probably in the first lectures uh, how my journey have started. I'm still bringing back here. In fact, uh, I was a bachelor student and I uh, was doing my thesis on Gujarat earthquake housing back in 2002 and uh, three, sometime, yeah, 2002. And that is how I come across uh, the right hand photograph, which is uh, Latur earthquake recovery, and as well as on the left hand side, we have the geodesic domes. So, where actually my journey has started. In fact, I thought this journey was a very short journey, but I never imagined that this has taken me so long and still I'm in the same paths working on it. And what the reaction I got by looking at this photograph on the right hand side is, this was a photograph from Latour earthquake uh, recovery programs where many of the houses are still lying empty and they're unoccupied. So the first question which came into my mind was why these higher technologically well-built constructions were unoccupied by the local inhabitants. So this question, to answer this question, I started looking at working on my thesis on the housing rehabilitation in Kutch in the Gujarat earthquake. So I come across, uh, though there are many concrete structures and permanent structures where the agencies have started giving and how people are not happy about it and how people are not comfortable uh, in it. So with those gaps I still had some interest on developing an understanding on the role of culture and what is this vernacular architecture and that is where I passed through uh, ISVA, uh, which is the International Studies in Vernacular Architecture. And even there, uh, with my elective, sub with my subject on natural hazards and environment, I developed an understanding a little deeper into it. And then in another 2004, by the time my master's was getting over, before my thesis, I got a chance to work on the thesis on the immediate impact of the disaster. And that is where I'm looking at the kind of gap between the community and development groups and what is this uh, interaction gap. In fact, um, this is where I worked on the few villages I visited in uh, Kadalu district, Devanapatanam and uh, in the Nagapatanam districts. So that was a beginning step and still after that, I moved to a kind of uh, villain's role. After my master's, I was working with Benfield Advanced Timber Frame Technologies, where I was engaged in uh, working on uh, prefab timber frame technologies. And there was a project came from United Nations World Tourism Organizations. Um, in 2005, there was a Kashmir earthquake, and uh, there was a project is all about sending a few houses, prefab houses, to the Kashmir, the, the Pakistan occupied uh, Kashmir, or we call it the POK, or the others we call it the Ajad Kashmir part of it. So, where I was designing everything from Britain and shipping these houses to 
the Pakistan occupied Kashmir and uh, I was not aware of who was the owner and how it was built neither I don't know what was the site it was a prefab component manufactured in the factory and packed up like a IKEA furniture and then sent it in the ship and someone goes there and someone erects it so this is where some of the questions started coming in mind I'm because I'm working from the practice side also and uh, how these gaps could be concealed and uh, how they can be looked into and this is where I started uh, the very uh, first understanding which I started was understanding the basic terminology and that is where the beginning part of my doctoral research at University of Westminster under Tony Lloyd Jones and Marianne Roberts and uh, this was a time I'm talking from 2006 to almost like 2010 and in the very beginning I finished my doctorate in 2011 January so in the beginning stages I wanted to make clear within myself that what is development so there have been a various definitions I looked ac across from starting from Amar Chassain development as freedom where he talks about the ability that one or individual or a society or a community how they are able to access their resources and how they manage to survive so uh, in my context when I'm looking at disasters I looked at development in three phases one is the usual development processes which is even before the disaster the municipalities or the counties or the local panchayats how they are involved in the development process and just the immediate impact of a disaster, how the relief or the rescue operations that is also supported by various international NGOs and the national NGOs and that is also one set of development and the third one is with a little long term after the disaster following a disaster which is a post disaster development process. So what you can see here is uh, a traditional house. And you can see a post-disaster reconstructed. So here, what I'm looking at it is, it's not just only the dwelling units, but I'm also looking at who are the actors involved in it. Here, the local municipalities, the local communities are involved, the local stakeholders. Here, the international NGOs. But here is a long-term project of settlement and the adaptation process where part of NGO culture or the non-government organizations and there is a little interface between the local and the non-local so then I started looking at uh, understanding the basic concepts of the what is the relationship between the disasters development and vulnerability and that is where I come across a lot of literature in fact one person which I should thank is Rohit Jigyasu's work on his work to and Nepal and even Gujarat so where um, he talks about the reducing vulnerability through the local knowledge and uh, here what uh, he talks is uh, so he brings some of the models of uh, these development and disaster and vulnerability so ideally if a disaster uh, if the development is followed after a disaster which was a traditional model before Nidalatu, the disaster happens some the development follows upon it ideally the vulnerability should be less the factor that in reality our issue is the disaster component responds within the development we have the existing component that is where the vulnerability component is more and that is where we call is uh, our uh, is equal to vulnerability plus hazard so this is a very simple uh, equation in fact uh, it is not the hazard which is killing people it is not the hazard which is taking out the lives and livelihoods and the property like uh, if a cyclone comes yes uh, it just comes and goes even earthquake comes it comes and goes but what is the susceptible part of it is how you are prone to it now the same nine richer scale will come in Japan the same eight richer scale will come in California but still why you don't see that kind of losses here how you can see in the countries like India or Indonesia or even Ghana you know how you can see a more number of losses especially in because that is how we are susceptible and prone to those hazards though they are also prone but they are, their capacities are different they develop their capacities and 
And that is what we are talking about, this the relationship between disasters and development and vulnerability. One of the important person we have to bring is uh, Frederick Cunney, who actually brings a relationship between disasters and development. So, in fact, till that point, development was disasters. They, they are seen in until 1980s. They are seen as the two independent futures uh, uh, phenomena. But then, Kenny actually brings a relationship between the disasters and the development. And even uh, professors like Ian Davis, who actually talks about shelter after disasters and how disasters as a catalyst of change, how it can be as an agents of change both in a positive and the negative ways of it. Whereas Lewis, he talks about, it is not just a cycle, he talks it is a bicycle. But what he actually compares is, he puts the development which takes in the forward phase, but ideally if you are riding a bicycle, it should move in this way, but not really, it may move in this direction as well. So, uh, which because they both are not driven by the same force. So here one has to look at it, it's not the development always taking the vulnerability forward, but it's also the different forces bringing this vulnerability in a different direction. That is one uh, phase he talks is from the concept of moving of a cycle, disaster cycle to a disaster bicycle. Now, I started working on uh, the vulnerabilities. So the way I have started describing on the, the pre-disaster development and the post-disaster development, and that is where you can see even in these photographs in the villages which I have visited, the pre-disaster, they have problems of water supply, they have problems of sanitation, they have problems of various local disputes, you know, the land tenure issues. So we already have these vulnerable situations and disaster adds to it. So uh, with what we are having and how the disaster adds to it because the loss of heritage and loss of our infrastructure. So because uh, it is not just we can't see what has been lost but what has made them to loss and what is still, what are the pre-disaster situations. And now I will again show you the same photograph which I showed you earlier in a similar, same village where the post-disaster vulnerability, even after two years, still there were water issues and still people are. So what these photographs are telling is a span of two to three years. A span of two to three years, it is saying that, yes, it is the direct, it is their vulnerability is directly proportional with the kind of development and you know how actually development overlooks the pre-disaster conditions. Now I started the understanding that uh, in what way I can understand vulnerability. So I looked at various aspects of how one can understand the vulnerability. One is the technocentric analysis, which talks about the physical vulnerability of buildings through technical inspection of faults, weaknesses, and basically as civil engineers or the structural engineers or surveyors do come and understand the site, how it has failed, where it has failed, and Later from 1980s onwards, there's an awareness on the target group analysis because uh, every disaster happens. It is not every time it's uh, the same groups who are getting, you know, uh, having an impact. So now they are focusing on this target group. That is where the sociologists started looking at it, a target group. Who are these target group and why they are targeted, how they are targeted, you know. So, and that is where it talks about the social vulnerability. And the third one is a situational analysis. It is not uh, just in like a, what kind of a group or a person and or a family belongs to, but it is the nature of their daily life and their actual situation, how it was and how it is and how it is changing. So we are talking about a situation because sometimes a person might be poor before disaster or he might have become rich or he might have become a wealthy person became poor, you know, because of his loss of family and you know, so basically there's a tremendous change in the whole process and that is where one have to understand the situation. And the last model, we could talk about the community-based analysis, which is more of a kind of uh, PRA techniques where, uh, where we talk uh, about how NGOs work together to make awareness within the community, realize their problems and 
show them a direction how to build it. I'll tell you a good example of a Bollywood movie of Swadesh, where uh, Shah Rukh Khan, he, at the end of the, he goes to a village, a NASA scientist. He goes to a village and he helps all the villagers. In There was no electricity in that village. At the end, he only makes a, a, a small bulb and he brings electricity. But the whole process is all about how he makes the villagers realize their own indigenous issues. How he puts together, it's not just throwing a money and constructing electricity platforms for them, but how he actually puts the villagers in confidence and how he brings them and how he uplifts them so that they can help themselves in making dealing with their own issues. So that is where the community. But in this my research, because being a single person and handling it understanding the change, especially the culture, when we are talking about how this transformation, the pre-disaster to post-disaster context, how it is changing, how the response situation. So that is where I looked at uh, the situational analysis. And um, so there are other models which I can just give you a brief on this, the pressure and release model, which is of Blakey and uh, Terry Cannon and Davis, where they talked about this pressure and release model. So here also it says about how a progression of vulnerability, you have the root causes which you have the existing, so like for instance there are certain tribes or certain villages who have a very limited access to power structures and resources. And also the ideologies, like in the Arab countries they have a different ideology of gender. They have some power, limited power to the gender, you know, many of the people who died in tsunami from the fishermen communities, many of them are women and because women doesn't know how to swim. Whereas in the Western cultures, at least because if many of the women are familiar with the swimming, maybe they might have rescued themselves. So obviously, these are some of the root causes. Added to that, there is some kind of dynamic pressures which talks about how their uh, lack of local institutions, local training, and the local markets, you know, the, how the, rap, the change in the market trends and rapid urbanization. So these are all some everyday add-on things which adds more pressure to it. And ideally this whole process leads to unsafe conditions. That is where people living in squatter settlements, people living in an unsafe locations and lack of uh, local uh, institution supports and you know so this is the whole thing that is where we talk about the r is equal to h plus v so this is a model which we uh, talk about and uh, we're coming to the sustainable livelihoods model where uh, it's an asset framework Diffid uh, have developed this and later uh, Tony Lloyd Jones and Carol Ruckody have also have uh, worked on a kind of uh, basis. In fact, this the original model was developed in the, um, by Diffid in 1997 sometime and uh, uh, later how it was modified is because it is how the livelihood assets, how people manage their assets and how people cope up with how they can access the resources. So that is where they're linked with the vulnerability component and how the policies and institutions relate to it and how they derive to the infrastructure and services and at the same time the livelihood op opportunities. So this is a whole framework which we call it a sustainable livelihoods framework. And uh, But what is here missing is it is not just an economic necessity one looks at it or how one act upon. It is also about the cultural dimension or the cultural factors which where people manage their assets and make their livelihood choices to act upon. Now this is how I come to a point where how because there are a lot of literature working on the relationship between culture and built environment. I think in our previous many lectures have discussed about it. And uh, there is also about a lot of literature on culture and vulnerability. And there is also a lot of literature on uh, vulnerability and development. But how I am looking, because a sociologist can look this in a very different approach, an anthropologist can look at this component in a different approach. So I am looking, being an architect, I am looking from a built environment perspective. And not only built environment perspective, I am looking in a disaster context more specifically. So this is how I started looking at various work on Bodios, uh, cultural capital and Kim Dovis and the leech 
work and the Regina Lim's work. So this whole discussion, what we talked about habitus, cultural capital in my earlier lectures, this all have been read through and been analyzed to formulate uh, uh, my understanding on how I can go ahead with understanding the culture. So in uh, one of the model which I come across, especially from a built environment perspective, is uh, Regina Lim's model. And this is where she worked on, uh, she coins a term called cultural environment. It is a matrix, she defines this environment as a matrix of various dimensions of religion, belief system, the ecological environment, economy and the family structure, kinship, gender roles, politics, cultural interaction. So all this becomes a kind of matrix and how people, how this becomes the structures that create a cultural identity and this whole set she formulates it as a, she coins it as a cultural environment. Then uh, to give a little brief about Bodio's theory where uh, in 1986 in his book on forms of capital where he talks about three forms of capital. One is the inherited the, or uh, the embodied and the second one is an objectified and the third one is an institutional. So from an educational perspective this particular theory has been developed and you know, inherited how you learn from your parents and how your society, uh, the kind of language you will develop, the kind of habitual practices which you develop and similarly you know, objectifies how you portray your objects, how you uh, sculpts your being, you know, that possesses an identity. Like a fisherman boat in China and fisherman boat in Kerala and the fisherman boat in Bengal, all of them are doing fishing but their boats are different, the houses are different because that is how the representation comes into the, how they objectify through art and architecture. And institutional obviously it was been much debated because he talks about this, the popular culture as well. So, and then I think in our previous lectures we did discuss about a criticism on Bourdieu's uh, theory. And uh, from the built environment perspective where Neil Leach talks about identification of a space in three dimensions. One is the narrativism, performatives and mirroring. How we talk about spaces, how we narrate the spaces. Is it a footpath? Is it a market? How, so, so obviously this, the narrations talk about, in fact in our lecture series of power series of that, we talked about all the narrations where Dovi also narrates the Chinese uh, Tiananmen Square and the Najis um, uh, ideologies, how they have placed. Similarly on the performatives uh, where certain activities are performed and certain rituals are taken place. So there is action taken place and how it is remembered. And a similar actions are repeated by a course of time and uh, that is how one will develop an attachment to it. So that is where the mirroring comes up. So this is on the discussion on the culture but whereas to cut short it, I would now bring to the, there was always a, a dialogue of how in a disaster situation, how we can bring back to the same situation. Now whether we need to bring back to the same situation or we need to build back better. So in fact that is where the arguments of globalization, you know, because now people can now cannot, Deborah Lupton talks about, now people cannot simply rely on local knowledge, tradition and religious perceptions, habit or observation of other processes to conduct their everyday lives as they did in pre-modern or early modern times. So there is a, always a conflict between tradition and the, there is a tension between the tradition and the modern, you know, because obviously each influences each other, there is a, a little contest between these subjects. And that's how I started defining of how we can define the culture. Culture is defined as a sum of total experiences and accumulated indigenous knowledge within the space that communities rely on and giving meanings to their lives and places they live in through which habit people habitually develop an approach to survive their li everyday life whether it is a pre-disaster situation or a post-disaster response situation. So, this is how we, we here I brought some kind of experiences and how it transforms through their habitual practices. Now, again, here the main argument of the study talks about is 
the cultural dimensions of local communities are not effectively and sufficiently addressed in the current post-disaster humanitarian and development processes. But to the disadvantage of both the communities affected and the humanitarian development agencies helping them. So here I am bringing the component of because why we have to address, why the culture, when the culture is overlooked in the process, it is not only a disadvantage to the communities, but it is also a disadvantage to the NGOs or the humanitarian agencies working on those projects. Uh, how much investment do you think about the Latour earthquake has been spent? And uh, what happens to those investment if someone is not, uh, some development is not compatible with the local cultures? So that's how I started looking at how to understand the role of culture in the post-disaster recovery process and its relation to the vulnerability. Here, the very it was important for me to address with culture, it's not just only the role of culture in the post-disaster recovery process, but what is the relation, how it can reduce or increase the vulnerable situation, in particular to the built environment of affected traditional settlements. So now, uh, after looking at various theoretical discussions and various analysis of uh, deriving certain methods, I looked at two components. One is the cultural anthropology and the second one is the morphology which talks about the change. And these two fields of inquiry have been implemented, taken into consideration to understand the role of diversified cultures in the disasters and development setup. And then this is where I was started looking at various literature and how I can actually set a benchmark of whether this has achieved, this space has achieved a better environment or not. And that is where one of the good theories, uh, good old theories of responsive environments developed by Ian Bintley from Joint Center for Urban Design, the responsive environments where he talks about certain principles, permeability, legibility, variety, visual appropriateness, and uh, richness. And these all forms a set of a responsiveness of a place. And that is how I name this course, Culturally Responsive Built Environments. Now I developed a kind of framework. What I did was, I first divided this whole built environment into a kind of funnel type, where we have an ecological environment and we have a geographical landscape. And then the humans intervene and then they set up with a kind of public space, space structures, plots, buildings. So this is the built environment component. So you have the built environment component. And on one side you have the pre-disaster influences on it and the post-disaster influences of it. But another side of it is the culture component how, how, the structures which create an identity. So taking from the limbs model, so I started working on this, how this shapes the built environment, then the Bentley's work of responsive environments. So how these dimensions, I mean how these indices can actually check where, where space, whether uh, how this is shaping this place and how whether it is how it is qualifying this place and in both the country. This is how I developed a framework. It took me a long time to come with this kind of framework. And then I traveled across uh, to how many case studies I should select. Then I traveled across the Tamil Nadu, the uh, scope, uh, the coast of Tamil Nadu, visited many villages, 17 villages I visited. And then I've taken a criteria of some which are least affected, average affected, and the most affected. And then taken by NGOs, taken by in-situ, taken by relocation context. So all this criteria has been laid out. And the one good thing what I can see is here, when I was traveling down south from here to here, I can see that most of the Hindu population I found here and most of the Roman Catholic I found here and most of the mixed variety I found here. So I was wondering, oh, the social landscape is a little different because most of the fishermen here are the Roman Catholic and on the northern side more of the Hindu and here I can see the Muslim and near Karaikal and Nagapatnam and the mixed population. So um, then I started looking at the geographical aspects. I can see that the Coromandel coast, which has the shallow waters, and the Gulf of Malar, which have a deep waters. So here you can see that the shallow waters indicate less fish, and deep waters indicate more fish. The more fish, more money. Less fish, less money. So obviously it has an impact on the kind of nature of built environments. So not only that, I have also taken another criteria of, so one is the land is different, the second is the sea is different, the third is the communities are different. 
the th fourth one is development input is different. Here I have selected a Dalit village where the government is taking care of the reconstruction. Here an fisherman NGO is taking care of the Tarangambadi and in here it is the local church. So basically the three sets of development inputs, how they are relating and three different cultural geographic key component I have taken as a criteria to select my case studies. And then because of being study on culture, I looked at the kind of qualitative approaches where I have adopted the field work through direct, indirect participation, documentation and recording, interviews and the mapping exercises. Initially I adopted the questionnaires as well, but then I thought it was not possible to investigate the culture in that manner, so I have uh, taken it out and these are the, some of the um, methods which I used and this methods which I will be discussing again later in my next uh, lecture, the following lecture where this whole, I have conducted a, a kind of anthropological understanding, I lived there as a fisherman and I explain all these things. And here what happened is, in the coastal regulation zone, many of the houses following a coastal regulation zone, the villages have been relocated to some other place because they should not construct anything beyond this 500 meters from the high tide line. And uh, so we'll continue with the next uh, following up lecture, especially with the case studies. And uh, this is all developed from my own work. And uh, thank you very much.